Good afternoon. みなさまようこそいらっしゃい。よく来ていただきましてありがとうございます。あのこんにちは。こんにちは。<笑> okay. Um, I'll begin this、uh, 15th an,、uh, annual Japan Week, which began in、uh, 1997. So, and we took two years off. So, this is the 15th annual. And it began as an occasion to first celebrate Japanese language and culture. But eventually, we became very interested in bring people. Bringing people together on global issues that are facing us. And I would like to、uh, pay、uh, acknowledgement to the sponsors at this time who make this event possible.、Uh, one is the Kaitak、uh, USA, and I think people are busy this morning working.、Uh, there is a company called Trans Ocean Products,、uh, they have been supporting us. And there is a、uh, school in Tokyo called KCP International. Those are the three main sponsors, so I、uh, appreciate their support from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> And also, the event is co sponsored this year by the Haxi College of Environmental Studies. And there is the Dean、uh, Steve h o l d e n h o r s t present here, thank you. And also, the Office of Sustainability, led by Seth Vedania. Thank you very much. I'm so very happy to have、uh, De Dr. David Suzuki as the keynote speaker of this year. And、uh, I was、uh, thinking about this occasion, how wonderful. And I think you all feel the same way as I do. So I wanted to quote the very first passage from the Analects by Confucius. It says, How wonderful it is that we get to put into practice what we learn. How wonderful it is, how delightful it is that a friend comes from afar. And I think we all feel the same about David. So we are very happy to have him. And before we go into the main、uh, program, we have the president of this university welcoming Dr. Suzuki. Thank you. Well, it seems every, every couple of weeks we get a new ranking in one of the greenest colleges. Princeton, our review recently said, you know,、uh, the, we were ranked among the very top green universities. On occasion,、uh, our renewable energy use, we ranked better than any other、uh, university in the country. That's thanks to our students, by the way, who、uh, voted to、uh, tax themselves to buy that energy and long have done so. The ranking, somehow, we're using, a, a, somehow they said our. Use of green energy is 120% of our energy use. I don't know quite how we get that extra 20%. <laughs> that really, again, shows that I'm thinking about the creativity and innovation here at Western. And、uh, that's the,、uh, the note I want to end on simply as we look at the core values of this institution. What defines our students, our faculty, our alumni, and the communities we're proud to call home? And there are a couple of key values. One's adventurousness. We aren't scared off by challenges, they engage us in what we want to. Involved in.、Uh, second is innovation, willingness to fail, but to try new things. In, in these challenging times, I think that's the most important value any of us can have is not to be scared off, but be willing to try new things, not be afraid to try things that、uh, fail, but know that we're, we're smart people, we can learn from those failures. Certainly, being very clear about what our core commitment is is central. And last, and this just comes out in Bellingham and in our alumni and our students, it's knowing that it's not higher education unless it's put to higher purposes. Going to lead a purpose life. All that comes together. That's why I have、uh, great optimism and confidence about the future of Western, of the places we're proud to call home, of our state, and of our globe. Well, I know you've come here to listen to me. We're looking very much forward to hearing from Dr. Suzuki, a、uh, great educator, and,、uh, ed and communicator, and activist. So thank you all for being here. I look forward to、uh, listening along with you to Dr. Suzuki's comments. Thank you. ミチコは<咳>賛成ですからね、日本語を話しません。Je suis Canadien et à Canada, nous parlons français et anglais. <笑> I'm a, a, a guest here of the Department of Languages. I thought I should impress you with, with what I know, but I just told her I'm a Canadian, I can't speak Japanese, I'm sorry. 
I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for coming out on a beautiful day like this. I know you all want to be out there and uh, enjoying this, the sun, but thank you for coming in and spending this time with me. Before I begin, I'd like to do what I always do in Canada, which is to acknowledge that this is the traditional territory of the First Nations people that were in this area, and I thank them for having taken such good care of it for thousands of years. I'm here today to speak to you not as a broadcaster or journalist, not as a geneticist as I was trained. Uh, I'm here really to speak as an elder. And as an elder, We've divested ourselves of those frivolous pressures to seek fame and money or power. We're free of all that stuff. If an elder isn't free of that stuff, you better see a doctor. You've got problems. <laughs> Elders speak. They speak the truth that comes from having no hidden agenda. I'm here as a grandparent speaking as an elder to work towards some kind of future for my grandchildren. Elders are a very special group in society. We've got something no other group in society has. We have lived an entire life. We have made mistakes. We've celebrated successes, suffered under failures. We've learned a hell of a lot in a lifetime. Now we've got something to troll through and look for those nuggets of information that are passing on to the coming generation. So my my exhortation to my fellow elders is get the hell off the golf course or the couch and get on with the most important part of your lives. Because I believe, I believe elders with the power of youth and youth have everything at stake now at what is or is not going to happen in the coming years. It is youth that will live through what we decide to do or not to do. And youth with the power and the knowledge of elders, I think will be an unstoppable force. I, uh, I wrote a, a speech out. I was going to try to tie in my Japanese ethnicity to uh, Fukushima and then environmental. And uh, while I went down and had breakfast in, in downtown here, I said, screw that. I mean, I'll, I'll admit I'm a banana. I'm yellow on the outside, I'm white on the inside, and I'm going to give you my message through that... Uh, that medium. I, um, so I'm going to try to tell you how I got to the point that I'm at now, which is a very desperate point. We have urgent problems that I believe are not being faced with sufficient uh, energy and clarity. So let me trace the erratic career that I've had. I was trained in the United States thanks to American generosity in schools that I couldn't have where I got an education I couldn't possibly have obtained in Canada at that time. I was at Amherst College from 1954 to 58, and then the University of Chicago uh, to get my doctorate. I was beginning my scientific career as a geneticist in 1962, and I was totally thrown off track by a woman. Now that's happened to me throughout my life. <laughs> in this case, I'm grateful to her. My greatest regret is that I never met her. But in 1962, Rachel Carson published Silent Spring. And you cannot, the young people in the audience cannot imagine the impact of that book, which was all about the unexpected effects of pesticides. When her book came out, there wasn't a department of the environment in any government on the planet. Environment didn't mean what we come to understand it to mean today. And for me, as a gen budding geneticist, her book just hit me right between the eyes. Because what she said is, yeah, you scientists are clever. You can make powerful compounds like DDT. But you don't know enough to, ex to anticipate all of the, the consequences. Because first of all, the lab is not a replica of the real world. The lab is an artifact. Something that has very little to do with the real world out there. In the real world, everything is connected to everything else. And we don't know enough to anticipate the effects of what we do with our powerful technologies. And because of Rachel Carson, I went on with a genetics career. But I began to speak out about the dangers of trying to apply our incremental knowledge 
when we don't see the much bigger picture. Unfortunately, that warning from Rachel Carson to geneticists simply hasn't percolated through the genetics community today that speak of all of the exciting things they feel are going to happen with GMOs and genetic engineering and all that stuff. They never heard Rachel Carson's message. But because of Carson's book, I was soon swept up in the environmental movement that, that exploded around the world. Like millions of other people, I was caught up in it. And in Canada, the first thing that we became aware of was the American plan to test underground weapons in Amchitka in the Aleutian Islands. And so we began to raise the alarm and say that this might set off tidal waves or earthquakes. They might vent uh, clouds of radioactive gas from underground. And we began to say, this shouldn't be done. Well, Americans are no different then than they are today. They didn't give a shit what Canadians said. They went ahead and blasted them anyway. But one result of the objections to Amchitka was the birth of Greenpeace in Vancouver. Greenpeace was a made in Canada organization that I'm very proud to say has exploded and become a force around the world. In Vancouver, I was swept up in issues of clear cut logging, of pollution from pulp mills, of proposals to drill for oil in Hecate Strait between Haida Gwaii and the mainland. Uh, caught up in fighting a dam on the Peace River. And uh, as, as I began to become heavily involved, I thought the problem was human beings were taking too much stuff out of the environment and putting too much toxic waste and garbage back into it. So in my way of thinking, what we needed were departments of the environment. We needed laws to regulate what we were doing to air, water, and endangered species. And then you enforce your regulations. So in addition to campaigning on, on specific issues, we were lobbying governments to set up departments of the environment and enact laws. But by the early 70s, I realized it can't work that way. It can't work because we don't know enough to regulate through our laws that we set up. When nuclear power was first unleashed with the fission of, of atoms, we knew there was potential then to harness that energy. But you know, when the first bombs were dropped on Japan in 1945, we didn't even know there was a thing called nuclear fallout, radioactive fallout. We only learned about fallout in bikini years after Hiroshima. We didn't know there were electromagnetic pulses of gamma rays that knock out electrical circuits. We didn't know there was even a concept called nuclear winter or nuclear fall. We just went for the immediate return of the power of uh, unleashed in bombs, but we had no idea of the bigger picture within which that energy uh, would ramify. It's the same thing with DDT, as Rachel Carson put out uh, in her book. Spray DD DDT, it kills insects like mad. If you ask me as a biologist, was this smart? This is the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Insects are one of the most important groups, the largest group of organisms on the planet. They're absolutely vital for the health of ecosystems, terrestrial ecosystems around the world. To spray chemicals that kill all insects, just to get at one or two that are pests to us, strikes me as absolute stupidity. But even when we began, we gave the, the man who discovered the uh, uh, insecticidal properties of DDT, Paul Mueller, he got a Nobel Prize for it in 1948. Man, we thought that was a great idea. But by the time Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, we knew there were ramifications. We didn't, couldn't have anticipated the most amazing being biomagnification. When eagles began to disappear in the United States, scientists tracked it down to the fact that DDT sprayed at low concentrations would be amplified up the food chain. So by the time you get to the fatty glands and the fat tissue and the shell glands of birds and the breasts of women, DDT was concentrated hundreds of thousands of times beyond what uh, we had sprayed it at. By the 1960s, women's breast milk was considered too toxic to feed to babies. We didn't know about biomagnification till eagles began to show what could happen. CFC is the same thing. When scientists began we're, uh, we're eliminating the ozone layer, I have to admit. I said, what ozone layer? I didn't even know there was an ozone, ozone layer up there. Who would have imagined CFCs 
CFCs were chosen as to stuff into spray cans because they're chemically inert. They're big mole ring molecules with lots of chlorine on it, and they're inert. Chlorine is a very reactive element, but for some reason on CFCs, they don't react. So you fill up spray cans of them, they don't react with what you want sprayed, perfume or whatever you're spraying. Who would have imagined that high up above the Earth, CFCs would be hit by ultraviolet light, breaking off chlorine-free radicals, which scavenge ozone. Nobody could have anticipated that consequence when we began to use it. And mark my words, the same thing is going to happen with GMOs. We don't know enough to begin to apply these very powerful technologies in the manipulation of the genes of domestic plants and animals. So for me as a scientist by the early 1970s who was getting caught up in the environmental movement, this presented a dilemma. We need technology, much of it to solve the problems that we've created with technology in the first place. But since our ignorance is so vast, how could we possibly develop new technologies that wouldn't in turn create more technologies, uh, more difficulties that we hadn't anticipated? And you see it in spades right now. Many scientists are in such desperate uh, concern about the state of the atmosphere, about climate change, they're saying it's too late to do small things like bring in windmills and begin to re make our cars more energy efficient. We got to engineer the planet. Geoengineering is about the human arrogance that we have screwed up the atmosphere so bad that we're now going to take over for nature and we're going to engineer the atmosphere so that it doesn't create more uh, catastrophic climate change. The ultimate stupidity from not learning about what the mistakes we've made in the past. But what do we do then? We, we need and are constantly developing new technologies. And I believe that we've framed the problem the wrong way. And for me, the big change happened in the late 1970s when I became aware that there was a battle raging in our westernmost uh, archipelago, what uh, were once called the Queen Charlotte Islands, but are now called Haida Gwaii. Officially, they're known as Haida Gwaii. They come right off the panhandle of Alaska. It's the home of the, the Haida people. And for years, a battle had been raging Environmentalists and First Nations people, the Haida, were fighting against the logging interests and politicians to stop the logging practices on their lands. And so I decided to do a film about this battle for the nature of things. And I flew up there and uh, interviewed foresters and uh, forest company executives, loggers, environmentalists, politicians, and Haida. And one of them was an activist named Gujao who had led the Haida battle against logging for years. Now, I knew the villages of Masset and Skidigat had a very high level of unemployment, over 50% unemployment. Many of the loggers were Haida. The non-Haida loggers would come into their villages and shop in their stores. So I said to Guja, why are you fighting against logging? It brings economic opportunity to your communities. When the trees are gone, you'll still be here. Why are you fighting it? And his answer was very simple. He said, well, yeah, when the trees are gone, we'll still be here. But then we'll be just like everybody else. Now, at the time, he said that I was busy interviewing him and thinking about what's going to be in the cutting room. And I didn't think about it much until I got back to Vancouver and looked at the rushes and realized that simple statement, when the trees are gone, we'll be like everybody else had opened a window on a radically different way of seeing the world. What Guja was saying was, we Haida don't end at our skin or our fingertips. To be Haida means to be connected to the land. That the air, the water, the trees, the fish, the birds, all of that is what makes us Haida. The land embodies our history, our culture. The very reason why Haida are on this earth is told to them by their connection with the land. Destroy those elements, and you destroy what it is to be Haida. And so I realized as I began to learn, and I've been a student ever since, from indigenous people around the world, that sense of connection is the same. There is no environment out there, and we are here. We are literally created by the elements that come from what they call Mother Earth. 
And Mother Earth isn't some poetic or, or uh, metaphoric way of speaking. They mean it literally. We are created out of the earth. And they say the four sacred elements are earth, air, fire, and water. And as I reflected on that, I realized they are absolutely right. This ancient understanding is corroborated by the best science that we have. Think about what is the most important thing that we needed the moment every one of us left our mother's body. Well, of course, it was a breath of air. That first breath was to announce our arrival on the planet and inflate our lungs. And from that moment on to the last breath you take before you die, you need air 15 to 40 times a minute. And we don't even think about it. Well, I guess if you thought about it every minute, wouldn't have time for anything else. But I just want you to think about what does it mean to take a breath of air. <sighs> so easy, right? Two to three liters of air deep down into those most intimate organs in your body. If you've ever seen a, a fresh pair of lungs, preferably not from a human being, uh, and touched them. You know, they're kind of yicky, mushy, squishy. They're, they're very different from any other organ, and that's because they're mainly made of air. Our lungs, on average, have about 300 million alveoli, little capsules that are clustered like grapes around alveolar ducts. We have 300 million of them, and each alveolus is lined with a three-layered membrane that has uh, called a surfactant that reduces surface tension. We need 300 million of these to give the surface area to come into contact with each breath of air. If you flattened out all of the alveoli in two dimensions, it would cover a tennis court. So that's how much surface area is all folded up in our lungs. So when you take a breath, the air comes into contact with the surfactant, sticks, and instantly carbon dioxide comes out of your blood and oxygen and whatever else is in the air goes into your blood and hemoglobin molecules and red blood cells latch onto the oxygen and with each beat of your heart, oxygen is pumped to every cell in your body. And when you breathe out, you don't exhaust all of the air in your lungs. If you did that, your lungs would collapse. About half of the air stays in your lungs even when you exhale. So the point I'm making is we can't draw a line and say air ends here and I begin there. There is no line. The air is in us, stuck to us, and circulating through our bodies. We are air. And of course, the air that does come out of my nose very quickly mixes in this room, and you're all breathing air that was in my nose and from each other. When I tell kids this, you know, I always see them go, oh, yuck. You know, I guess they think they have a little bubble of air that belongs to them. We are air. It's in us. It's circulating through us. And air is that thin matrix that connects us together, not just with each other, but with the trees and the birds and the worms and the snakes that are all sharing the air. There's this wonderful thought exercise Harlow Shapley, an American astronomer, did many years ago. He said, what happens to one breath of air? Well, how do you follow a breath of air? Air is 98% oxygen and nitrogen. You breathe air in. Oxygen, of course, that's what we need. A lot of it, when you breathe out, never comes back out. 80% of the air is nitrogen. Some of it stays in your body. But 1% of air is an element called argon. And you're all students here at university. You know that argon belongs to a class of elements called the noble gases or the inert gases. They don't react chemically with anything. So uh, you breathe it in, argon goes into your body, breathe it out, comes right back out. So argon is a good marker for a breath of air. How many argon atoms in one breath of air? Shapley calculates 3 times 10 to the super 18. That's 3 followed by 18 zeros. Take it from me, that's a lot of argon, okay? So if we follow one breath of air coming out of Michiko's nose here, I know she's small, but that's okay, she's got big lungs. That air, within minutes, is mixing by convection through this room, and every one of us is breathing gazillions of argon atoms from that one original breath. But of course, a door is open, and soon, within a few hours, that breath has suffused itself across the Pacific, across, well, I guess the other way, across North America, around across the Atlantic. And according to Shapley, one year later, Every breath you take, wherever you are, because air is a single system, every breath you take will have about 15 argon atoms from that one original breath she took a year 
before. So on that basis, Shapley calculates, every breath you take has millions of argon atoms that were once in the bodies of Joan of Arc and Jesus Christ. That every breath you take has millions of argon atoms that were in the bodies of dinosaurs 65 million years ago. That every breath you take will suffuse life forms as far as we can see into the future. So air is this wonderful element. No wonder indigenous people call air sacred. It should be considered sacred. It connects us to the past, into the present and on into the future. It connects us to all life on the planet. We boast that we're intelligent. Oh, we're a clever animal. But what intelligent animal, knowing that air is this magical, sacred substance, would then proceed to use a toxic dump. To dump whatever we want as if it's free to use air. You ever heard of a carbon tax and heard what corporations say the minute you want to pay to dump stuff into sacred air? Man, the screaming you wouldn't believe. We want air to be free and we, we forget what a sacred substance it is. You know, it really grieves me. I know in Bellingham there are a lot of people here who are as green as can be and I see many of them downtown uh, pushing a stroller with a child, but you know where that child's nose is? Right at the level of the exhaust pipes of every car going by. You might as well hook up the exhaust into a mask and pump it straight into a child's nose. What are, on earth are we doing? We don't even think about the role of these elements in our lives. And of course, the same applies to water. The same applies to the earth, because every bit of the food we eat was once alive, and most of it was grown in the soil. And yet we use water. We use, we eat 60 to 80, 70 percent water by weight. We use water, we use the earth, to dump our most toxic chemicals. What kind of intelligence is that? And of course, all of the energy, they speak of earth, air, fire, and water. The fire is the fire of the sun. Every bit of the energy in your bodies that you need to move and grow and reproduce, all of that energy is sunlight. Sunlight captured by plants to, in photosynthesis, and we get that energy by eating the plants or the animals that eat the plants. Half of that energy of photosynthesis comes from the oceans, the other half is terrestrial, and we, one species out of perhaps 30 million, have decided to take over uh, over 40% of that what's called net primary productivity, the net absorbance of the sunlight through photosynthesis we've co-opted for ourselves. And of course, in the process, we deprive it of other, countless other species and drive them to extinction. So my lesson from, from uh, First Nations people around the world has been very, very profound. It's changed the way that I look at what were called environmental problems. We are at the center of the so-called environmental crisis and we are at the center of its victims if we don't uh, change our ways in a big way. When I was swept up in the environmental movement in the 60s and 70s, we celebrated victories. There was always pressure to drill for oil in the Alaskan National Wildlife Refuge, ANWR. That is the calving grounds of North America's great natural spectacle. The movement of the porcupine caribou herd and the calving grounds are right in ANWR. Apparently there's oil under ANWR and there have been, uh, there has been periodic pressure to drill for oil in Anwar. Each time the pressure built up, I did a program about the porcupine caribou herd and helped to beat back the forces that wanted to drill. We, uh, there was a proposal when the oil was discovered in Alaska, they wanted to ship oil from the North Slope down the coast of British Columbia to Seattle to refine it, and we then began to fight against that and got a halt, a moratorium on all supertankers down the coast of British Columbia. We stopped a proposal to drill for oil in Hecate Strait between the mainland and Haida Gwaii. We stopped a dam to be built at Site C on the Peace River. And in the 70s, 80s, I got very involved with the Kayapo Indians in Amazon, and we stopped a $500 million loan from the World Bank that stopped a dam to be built in their territory. We celebrated these as victories, but guess what? Every one of these issues is back on the agenda. You've all heard of Sarah Palin and Drill Baby Drill. 
the dams that sightsee on the Peace River and the dam at, in Altamira in, the, in Brazil, they're already going. The uh, proposal is to drill for oil again in Hecate Strait and bring super tankers with Alberta oil through some of the most treacherous waters of the British Columbia coast. What does that tell us? The environmental movement, successful as it was in the first decades of the movement, has fundamentally failed. We failed to shift the way we see ourselves on this planet. It's what's called the paradigm. We've failed to move the paradigm. In stopping a dam, we thought, oh, that's great. But we didn't teach the deeper lesson why that dam really had to be stopped. It was just a matter of battles against, you know, one industry against us, and we beat them down. But the bigger issue was, why? Why did this battle arise in the first place, and how do we see ourselves in relation to Mother Earth? And that is the crisis we face today. Many of my colleagues now, people I have great respect for, are saying it's too late, that we've passed too many tipping points, and we can't go back. And I have to say the evidence they cite is very, very compelling. But I don't think it, there's any point in saying it's too late. Yes, we have passed tipping points like a two-degree rise this century. People are even talking about four-degree rise by 2050, which is absolutely catastrophic. People are talking about a six-degree degree rise by 2100. But there's no point saying it's too late. We're going to fight to the end. And what's the point of adding to a problem that's already here? But, but let's get the frame right. Let's see the world as it really is. We live in a world that is shaped by laws of nature. In physics, we know that the speed of light is the utter, uh, upper limit of how fast we could build a rocket. Nobody brings a proposal that I'm going to travel at 10 times the speed of light. We know that that's a limit. We know the law of gravity means you can't have an anti-gravity machine here on Earth. And we know that the laws of entropy, first and second law of thermodynamics, means that you can't build a perpetual motion machine on Earth. We know that. And we live within that. That's, those are laws that shape our lives and the world around us. In chemistry, Many laws that govern rates of reaction, diffusion constants, the uh, atomic property of the different elements that tell us what kinds of chemical reactions and molecules we can create. And we accept that. Those are laws that come to us from chemistry. Well, the same thing is true in biology. In biology, we know there are laws from ecology talking about carrying capacity, that in order to sustain a population of any species, you have to live within the capacity of an ecosystem to support that particular species indefinitely. Humans have gone, we don't, aren't limited to a specific ecosystem or habitat. We have take, taken over the entire biosphere, but there are still limits that are dictated by carrying capacity. And the fact is that we are limited, or constrained, I think wonderfully constrained, by our biological makeup. We are animals. And I was never as surprised as I was a few years ago when I went to Austin, Texas for the first um, annual meeting of the Green Builders uh, Association. And in the audience I had, there were a number of young people, and I said, now kids, if there's one thing you remember from my talk, Remember, we are animals. I was shocked at how pissed off people got at me. Don't call my daughter an animal. We're human beings. And the denial of our animal nature is really amazing. And you can see it reflected in our language. If you call someone an ape or a, a worm or a snake or a pig or a chicken, these are all insults because they elevate us above these other species. I was in a store, uh, went into a store in Calgary, Big sign on the front of the store said, no animals allowed. So I went in to see the proprietor. I said, you know, if you enforce that sign, you're not going to have customers. <laughs> and the funny thing or the frightening thing was, he didn't know what the hell I was talking about. I mean, he thought I was nuts. We are animals. And as animals, our most important need is a breath of air. Without air for more than three or four minutes, you're either brain damaged or dead. So surely to goodness, air 
ought to be as a society our highest priority. The protection of the quality of air should come before anything else. We are water. Go without water for more than a, a few days, you're dead. Drink, have to drink contaminated water, you're sick. So surely water, like air, should be one of our society's highest priorities. And we are created out of the food that we eat. So protecting the soil that gives us our food should be one of our highest priorities. And protecting the photosynthetic capacity of the planet is in our highest self-interest. So what I've learned from indigenous people is right. Our highest priority should be the sacred elements, earth, air, fire, and water. And what we also learn is that our relatives, the other animals and the plants that share the planet with us, are what cleanse, refresh, replenish the four sacred elements. It's life itself that cleanses and creates the four elements that we need for our well-being and survival. So for me, if you're going to talk about a shift in our paradigm, it is to recognize what indigenous people have always known, that we are created out of, out of the elements of Mother Earth. And those should be our greatest responsibility to protect them for ourselves and the rest of life on Earth. What we have done, though, is we've been captured by this incredible ah, what do you call it, I don't want to say hubris, but the enthusiasm for what we've seen in, as progress in the last hundred years. Our technological ability in the past hundred years has been nothing short of amazing. And this has all come together then in this, at this time. Our numbers, we have suddenly exploded in numbers. There were never a billion humans on the planet until in the early 1800s. And in, I was born in 1936 when there were one, just over two billion people in the world. Can you imagine in the lifetime of a single human being, the population has more than tripled. And each one of us, the seven billion of us, has to breathe air, drink water, eat food, clothe and shelter ourselves. So just the act of staying alive means with seven billion of us, never, there were never a billion mammals ever in the history of life on Earth. Now that there are seven billion of us, we have a very heavy ecological footprint. It takes a lot of air, water, and land to just keep us alive. But of course, we're much more than just rats or rabbits or mice. Uh, just to get down here, I had to use computers and telephones and a car, all that technology to bring me from Vancouver down to this auditorium. And I look around in this hall, I am absolutely sure there's no one in this audience who's got a backyard with a field of cotton plants or sheep. And yet you're wearing wool and cotton. We all use technology on our behalf that allows us to live the way we do. And that amplifies our ecological footprint many times. And Americans especially love to shop. Man, do you like stuff. And I'm afraid it's tempting Canadians to come across a border because your stuff is so plentiful and cheap. Well, uh, all of that consumption elevates our ecological footprint. And now we have a global economy to exploit the entire planet for raw materials and to dump our waste and toxic chemicals into the entire biosphere. And when you add all that up, our numbers, our technology, our consumption, and our global economy we have become a new kind of force on the planet. We are altering the physical, chemical, and biological properties of the planet on a geological scale. There's never been a species on Earth that has a capacity to do what we are doing. That's why geologists now are, are saying this is the Anthropocene epoch, the age of man, when humans have become a geological force. But we don't know enough to be able to anticipate what the effect of our great power is. So I believe that we have to return to understanding laws of nature in physics, chemistry, and biology that dictate the limits of what we can do. Other things, we draw borders around our property, around our cities, our states, our countries. 
And man, do we take those borders seriously. I mean, I understand in the United States you are legally, or maybe it's just in Texas, allowed to shoot somebody coming on your property because it's an invasion of your right. We take our borders, we go to war, we kill and die to protect our borders. But you know what? Nature couldn't give two hoots about our borders. Every year, hundreds of th thousands of tons of dust are blown across the Atlantic from Alaska and land on the United States and in the oceans. Every year, animals, caribou, uh, bears, all kinds of animals and plants, trees, move freely between borders. Do you think they care whether they're Washington, Washington bears or Canadian bears? They, our borders mean nothing to the natural world. We have a salmon commission regulating salmon. Wait a minute now. Salmon are born in British Columbia rivers. Oh yeah, but they're caught in Alaskan waters. Whose are they? They're neither. The salmon know very well who they belong to and, and where they are. But we think our borders are so important. And then we create other ideas. We create things like capitalism, like the economy, like corporations and the market. And my God, you talk to one of these neocons about the market. And, you know, someone might be perfectly reasonable, you know, an Ann Coulter or somebody. Then you say, the market, and oh, the market, and their eyes glaze over. Yes, the market, hallelujah, free the market, let the market do its thing. You know, the Friedmanites and all. What a lot of garbage. We invented the goddamn thing. And now we want to... We want to shoehorn nature into our agenda. And you saw it in spades at Copenhagen a couple of years ago. 192 countries gathered at Copenhagen to deal with the atmosphere that doesn't belong to anyone. 192 countries dealing through the political and economic lenses of 192 separate nations. Asking the atmosphere, please fit our program so that we can continue to exist economically and politically. It's absolute madness and it's bound to fail. And it takes just a simple twist in the way that we look at the world to see where the solutions lie. The simple twist is to realize we are not in control. We are utterly dependent for our well-being and survival on the health of the biosphere. If the air... We have a wonderful process that was started a few years ago called PENSIMA, Pacific North Coast Integrated Management Area. And it was a, a new attempt by government, First Nations, industry, and, and citizens groups to take all of the coastal waters from the uh, top of, north of uh, Vancouver Island right up to Alaska. All of that water was going to be managed by everybody. And I was invited to give the opening address to this group, and I said, you know, this is very, very exciting. It will only work if you all leave your vested interests outside the door and you all accept that the health of the oceans is the highest priority. As long as the ocean ecosystem is healthy, then everybody will benefit. And then the only question is, how do we divvy up what nature has produced? But you have to put the health of the ecosystem above your interest. As soon as I shut up, guy jumped up and said, I'm a fourth generation fisherman. Don't tell me to suppress my needs. I'm here to fight for, for my rights as a, as a long-term fish. So, you know, we, if it just takes a switch to realize that our well-being and health is utterly dependent on the well-being and the health of nature itself. We keep saying, you know, I'm sure you've all heard about the triple bottom line. Triple bottom line is the economy, society, and the environment. And often the triple bottom line is designated as three circles of each size. And where they all intersect, that's the sweet spot. That's where you do your activities in that overlap area and you benefit society, the economy, and the environment. This is the most ludicrous idea I have ever heard. Forget the triple bottom line. It's ridiculous. The environment is everything. So the, real, the reality is we should depict that as a big circle 
Within that big circle are 30 million tiny circles. That's the 30 million species that inhabit the planet. They all overlap in many ways. But the reality is one of those circles within the big circle is now over 40% of the area of the biosphere and that's because it's us. We have taken over over 40% of the net primary productivity of the planet. And within, and so clearly, the challenge is to reduce our circle within that planet. We've got to reduce and get back down to a size that makes sense. And within that circle, which is us, is a much smaller circle, which is the economy. That should be the way that we look at it. The biosphere, our species, and the economy, which is a human construct to serve people, not corporations. The problem now is that we have everybody, corporations trying to be environmentally responsible and tell you all the things they're doing. They're cutting down on energy use and garbage. And guess what? They're making a lot of money. But my, my response is, wait a minute now, this doesn't make sense. We're always told by politicians, get, your, get off the, the corporations, let them do their thing. They're so efficient. But what the hell if you're making money reducing energy and, and resource throughput, what the hell took you so long? We're trying to, f you're being forced to do that. No, the, uh, the problem we face is the economy itself that we're trying to get working properly is so fundamentally flawed, it's got to be fixed in a major way. And the two... I know in America this is a heretical thing. I'm glad to see there are a few people that would clap at that response. Uh, we, um, the, the problem from my standpoint is that economists are so impressed with what humans do. Our capacity for inventiveness and productivity is so great that we create an economy based on human productivity and inventiveness. So economists actually think the economy can keep growing forever because there's no limit to human imagination. But wait a minute now, what is it that delivers the air that we can breathe? Guess what, it's all the green things on the planet. Surely that should, does that have a value in our economic system? Guess what, economists call that an externality. And what I found out is they don't care about that. It's considered so vast, it's irrelevant to our economy. Nature is constantly performing services that, will, that we take for granted that are vital for our very survival, like exchanging carbon dioxide for oxygen. Not a bad function for us. In Vancouver, we get all of our water from three old, gro old growth watersheds. We don't have to do anything to that water. It's filtered for us by root systems and soil fungi and so on. Every bit of our food was once from the natural world and all of our energy is photosynthetic energy. So, you know, life, and you know, you think of bees that pollinate flowering plants and all of the services that keep the planet healthy for us, and economists disregard those as irrelevant to our economic system. If that isn't the fundamental flaw, I don't know what is. And in the crude kind of calculation, what would it cost us to replace what nature does for free and of course, we can't replace most of it like pollination and so on. But if we tried to put a value on replacing what nature does, it comes to over two times the total, the collective uh, GDPs of every country in the world it would cost us to replace what nature does for nothing. And that's not even in our economic uh, system. So I think that's a rather fundamental flaw in our economic system. But then we have really loony people that believe the economy not only can, which it cannot, but must grow forever. We live within the confines of the biosphere. It's a very, very thin layer. Carl Sagan told us years ago, if you shrink the earth to the size of a basketball, the biosphere, the zone of air, water, and land where all life exists, would be a thinner than a layer of saran wrap. That's it, and we've filled it up. So that's our home. Nothing within the biosphere can grow forever unless you really think we're going to have rockets and go harness asteroids and other planets and, and come to see me. I got something to sell you. But 
The biosphere is our home. Just as a cancer cell in our bodies may be insignificant, you can't allow it to grow indefinitely or it's going to have consequences. And it's the same thing with the economy. Nothing can grow within a finite world forever. And I just want to illustrate that with something I've been saying for years. Anything growing steadily over time, whether it's the amount of garbage you make, the amount of land in your city, the population of the city or, or the world, anything growing steadily over time is called exponential growth. And anything growing exponentially has a predictable doubling time. Okay? So if it's growing at 1% a year, it'll double in 70 years. 2% a year in 35 years. 3% in 24 and a half. 4% in 17 and a half. So anything growing steadily has a predictable doubling time. I'm going to give you a system analogous to planet Earth. It's a test tube full of food for bacteria. So the test tube and food are the planet. The bacteria are us. I'm going to put one bacterium in this test tube, and it's going to double every minute. Okay, so that's exponential growth. Time zero, one cell. One minute, there are two. Two minutes, there are four. Three minutes, eight. That's exponential growth. And at 60 minutes, the test tube is completely packed with bacteria, and there's no food left. Okay, when is the test tube half full? And of course, the answer is it's 59 minutes. 59 minutes of a 60-minute cycle, it's half full. So 58 minutes, it's 25% full. 57 minutes, 12.5% full. 55 minutes of a 60-minute cycle, it's 3% full. So if at 55 minutes, one of the bacteria said, hey, guys, I've been thinking, we got a population problem. The other bacteria would say, Jack, what the hell have you been smoking, man? 97% of the test tube's empty, and we've been around for 55 minutes. And they'd be five minutes away from filling it. What happens if they dump at 59 minutes ago? Oh my God, Jack was right. We got to do something. We're running. We have one minute left. So they dump all their money in, not those economists, those scientists. And in less than a minute, scientists invent out of what? Three brand new test tubes full of food. So they, that would be like us finding three more planets. Completely habitable, right? So they're, they're saved, right? So what happens? 60 minutes, the first one's full. 61 minutes, the second's full. 62 minutes, all four are full. By quadrupling the amount of food and space, we buy two extra minutes. And every scientist I've talked to agrees with me. We're already past the 59th minute. Now, when I say this to politicians and business people, they become very, very agitated, as you might expect. How dare you say that? Look at the stores. Even in Bellingham, you've got huge stores. And Do you have a Walmart here? You know, like... Yeah, we got all that stuff. How dare you say we're past the 59th minute? Well, I say it with pride. I don't back down from that. You don't have to listen to me or any other enviro. Just talk to your elders. Ask your elders what Bellingham was like 90 years ago. Talk to your elders anywhere in the world. And almost all of them will say the same thing. It used to be so different. I've been down the Amazon, for God's sake. And they say, there used to be trees as far as you could see. The skies used to be dark with birds at certain times of the year. The rivers used to be jammed with fish. Our elders are a living record of enormous changes that have taken place in the span of a single human life. And my bet is there are still First Nations elders right here in Washington who will tell you about the oceans and rivers filled with salmon beyond anything the young people here today can even imagine. What do you think we're doing in the name of economic progress, we're using up the rightful legacy of future generations. And we're undermining the very biosphere that we depend on for our very survival. Sorry, I didn't realize it gone on too long. Let me just, are there th what things that we can do? Of course there are things that we can do. My goodness, what a big battle you have in the United States, though, to see the denial that's going on fueled by hundreds of millions of dollars from the fossil fuel industry and the Koch brothers to, to create the sense that scientists are just in it for their own interest, that there's a lot of that this is a hoax. My God, what is going on? And I'm, I'm afraid your, the attitude in America is now infusing Canada. We have the most right-wing government we've ever had in the history of Canada at the time when we need governments that pay attention to science. What do we need in, in Canada in one small way? 
My foundation is now pressing for a constitutional amendment to make the right to a healthy environment constitutionally guaranteed. Now, who could... Thank you. Who could ever think, who could ever think that that would be something objectionable? Of course we want to right to a healthy environment. But when you think about what that means, you can't just go willy-nilly and cut down trees and build fish farms and do all of these things without asking the big question, what about the health of our kids and future generations? It has a huge impact. And I can tell you, I'll give you examples. Bolivia, Ecuador, two of the poor countries in South America. And guess what? Bolivia has elected the first indigenous pe person in the world Evo Morales to be the president of Bolivia. And both Bolivia and Ecuador have now placed Pachamama, Mother Earth, in their constitution, which means that fish and trees and birds and rivers have a constitutionally guaranteed right to exist and flourish. Well, you could say that's just... You could say that's just words, but think of what's happened already in Ecuador. In Ecuador, in the southern part of Ecuador, there's a river called the Vilcabamba River. And it's reputed that this river is special and people living along its shores live much longer than average. And so naturally, a lot of Americans ran down there and started buying up space. Typical American response, you've got to live down near the fresh waters of the Vilcabamba. And a, an American couple with quite a few acres on the Vilcabamba, noticed that a, a road building company was building a road along the valley, and as they were cutting notches in the, the valley side, they were dumping the boulders and, and rock and gravel into the, riv the Vilcabamba River. And finally, it closed the river at, at some point, and the, since the river was now narrowed, the speed with which it flowed was much faster, and it tore out half of their property in a flood after a big rain. So they uh, got very angry and they sued the, on be the, the road building company on behalf of the Vilcabamba River. And that was allowed because of the constitutional guarantee of Pachamama. Now you can't sue, you can't sue for money because the river doesn't need the money. But you can sue to have the river restored and they won their case against the road building company. That's, that's the power of enshrining the rights of nature. But of course, Ecuador has got problems. They've got lots of oil, and uh, they, they're a poor country. They see the need to, uh, to have uh, economic uh, uh, growth in their country. So there is a battle going on within Ecuador itself. For me, the great uh, hope is this tiny country in the Himalayas called Bhutan. And Bhutan, I'm sure many of you have heard, was this tiny country. Today there are 700,000 people living in it. It's, uh, the, it was out of sight of the world for 300 years. And it's surrounded by mountains, and so India or China really couldn't get at this tiny country. It was solidified into a, a, a kingdom in 1907, became uh, a king. And in the mid-1900s, the king, the third king, decided... We, we can't just exist like this any longer. We've got to get out. And they began to send people, kids, out into schools in India to get educated about the world around. And those kids, 100 kids a year, uh, you know, they went on to Oxford and Harvard and Cambridge. And as they began to come back to, to Bhutan, they started to say, you're not going to believe what people out there think development is. They think development is about money and stuff. And in 1972, the king of Bhutan was interviewed by a reporter in India who asked, well, what is the state of Bhutan's GNP? And that's when the king famously said, we're not interested in GNP, we're interested in GNH, gross national happiness. And the happiness has been adopted very much by the Bhutanese. And last year in July, they introduced a resolution of the United Nations saying that the well-being of life and the happiness of people should be the goal of governments and economies. It was co-signed by 68 countries and passed unanimously through the United Nations. 
This, I believe, is a real potential game changer because as their resolution says, this is a new paradigm for development. Can you imagine the economy? We're not here to serve the economy. The economy is here to serve us. What a, an amazing idea. And that our well-being and happiness depends on the well-being of the rest of creation. So I see these big changes that are potential as meanwhile the juggernaut of the conventional economy continues to move on. We've got a few years and it's pretty vital. So again, to my fellow elders, let's get going. We've got a lot of work to do. Thank you. I just want to. Yep. I just want to say, David, you are a tremendous inspiration to all of us here in this audience. I. I live down in the northern central California area and joined a long time ago the branch of the Sierra Club about saving our redwood trees, and just. Fairly recently, we wrested a huge enclave of old growth away from, as you've just stated in this lecture, about exploitation of a lumber company in Scotia. And I just want to thank you so much for well, being here and explaining to all of us the tremendous danger that we face. Thank you. Yes. We're all in the same bioregion. We're sharing it. What always amazed me, though, was to, you know, we're in, in Washington and Oregon where you've cut down 90% of your old growth, and they still call environmentalists greedy for wanting to protect the last 10%. Just didn't make any sense to me at all. Anyway, the, the problem, of course, is that we've saved over the years many areas as parks and reserves, but with climate change now, it's changing the whole nature of what's gonna, what a park is going to be because the plants and animals are gonna to have to move in order to stay in their proper regime. We really are altering the, the, the living forms on the surface of the planet. Yeah, I, I have a two, two quick questions. Um, first is, I, I'm really surrounded by a lot of people that are in this university that sort of get how huge these problems are but are still kind of, it's, the vision of the future, this not really getting it, that this is the absolute most important thing in the world is doing something about this, and if we don't, the future we have right now isn't really going to be the way it is. How do, how do we communicate that? And then the, the second question I have is about, if you could speak a little bit about the, if you, I'm sure you're aware of the transition towns and the whole transition idea. Yeah. Well, I'm very excited by transition town because I think that's where it's at. You know, a lot of us used to run around in the 70s saying, think globally and act locally. But the minute most people think globally, they go, oh my God, you know, I'm insignificant in the global, what can I do? And I really think that Thomas Berry was right. We've got to think locally and act locally to have any hope of being effective globally. Transition Town is a really profound re-examination of, of this place and how we relate to that place. And I believe that the local community is going to be the unit of survival into the future. So. Uh, We've got to start thinking about that in Canada. You know, we've taken it for granted that Canada, which is a cold country, you can buy fresh fruit and vegetables 12 months of the year. Where the hell are we growing this in Canada? We're not. You know, we get apples from New Zealand and mangoes from India. And it's just crazy. But there's a whole urban food movement that's being fueled by young people that I find very, very exciting because it's a re-examination of our place on Earth. The hard part of... of selling the idea the economy is broke and it can't work is that we've got generations built on expectations of constant titillation. You mean you're saying we can't have a new iPad next year or a new iPod or a cell phone? People find that very, very hard to accept. But the answer is yes! We don't need a new iPad or an iPhone or whatever it is. I mean, how can we have Apple, the richest corporation on the planet, 
Still very profitable, but guess what? Their stock values dropped. Why? Because their profit share hasn't continued to increase. How much is enough? You know, we've really got to look at this. This is crazy because all of that growth is at the expense of future generations. I'll let you, someone else decide who to. I have a question up here. Uh, you talked about the 30 million species, uh, and we're 40 percent of it. Our human circle is 40 percent of it. I'm wondering if there's any planning going on in the world that you're aware of internationally that gives you hope that there's some uh, reason to think we could shrink that circle. Well, this David Brower, of course, for years talked about the great challenge, which is to rewild the planet. And the, uh, yes, there are groups that are thinking in the, the big picture, uh, but the, one of the more interesting ones, a man I have huge admiration for, he's a, a journalist with The Guardian named George Mambio, and George wrote a book called Heat, which really put everybody's feet to the fire, that we, you know, windmills and all that stuff are pretty trivial when you look at the big picture. I mean, he's a really deep thinker, and he's got a book that hasn't come out yet called Feral. Feral... Feral plants and animals are, are ones that we had domesticated that are now getting back out. And he's saying that we've got to rewild the planet in some way and has worked out ways that we can do this on a big scale. But to do that, we have to have the commitment that comes from recognition that this is absolutely vital for our well-being and survival. And right now in Canada, for example, we're, just, we're going to exter extirpate the last grizzly in British Columbia, the last spotted owl, because we won't give them the space they need. They need space, and we're not willing to give it to them. We, uh, you know, the Brundtland Commission report said we should leave 12% of the land for parks and protected areas. Well, I mean, uh, that is a ludicrous number. That means 88% is for us to use, and yet we're, most places in the world are finding it very hard to even live up to 12% protection. So. Rewilding is a great challenge, but I don't know uh, how we get the will to do it. Uh, I'm just wondering what lessons you have for us about how we can together uh, prioritize posterity. It seems if you look at, this, at the uh, budgets, uh, very little is going to children, very uh, little is going to youth. Yeah. And so it, it doesn't make sense because I think some of the people who control that capital must be parents. So how do you... How do you make that shift? What kind of lessons have you learned? Well, it is, it is very strange uh, that, you know, we, I don't know if you have this expression here called helicopter parents, and these are parents just hovering over their kids, just take, we take such great care, we won't let them climb trees that might fall off, you don't want to have a park over there because they got stinging nettles or bees, you know. We are coddling these kids so much, and yet we don't give a shit about the future that we're leaving them. <laughs> This is astonishing. I think part of the problem is this. For 95% of human existence, we were nomadic hunter-gatherers. When you're a nomadic hunter-gatherer following animals and plants through the seasons, you know damn well you're part of nature and utterly dependent on nature. In the last 10,000 years, the last 5% of human existence, that began the agricultural revolution. And any farmer knows that the weather, climate, the seasons matter very much. They know you need insects to pollinate plants. They know that certain species of plants will make fertilizer from the nitrogen in the air. Farmers know we depend on nature. In 1900, when there were a billion and a half people on the planet, there were only 14 cities in the world with more than a million people. And my bet is if you looked at a map of the United States, it would have been dotted with little agri agricultural villages. 150, 200 people, because even in 1900, we were still an agrarian, ag agricultural species. So we knew Mother Nature was important. Cut ahead 100 years, by the year 2000, there were four times as many people, six billion of us. But there were more than 400 cities with more than a million people. In the United States and Canada, over 80% of us now live in a big city. I have a friend that lives in the north end of Toronto, Canada's biggest city, and he said to me one day, you know, my apartment building is completely air-conditioned. I go down the elevator to the basement, get in my car, it's air-conditioned. I drive down the expressway to my commercial building, 
It's completely air-conditioned and connected through tunnels to shopping areas. He said, I don't have to go outside for days. So in a city, your highest priority becomes your job. You need a job to earn the money to buy the things you want. And so the economy then becomes our highest priority because we've been fundamentally disconnected from the recognition that what we do now has huge repercussions for my children and grandchildren. And so that's really the challenge of changing the paradigm. We've got to start thinking far more about our kids and our grandchildren. Children don't vote. Politicians, because of the nature of the game, they can only think to the next election. So children aren't in the equation. Not because uh, politicians are stupid or evil or greedy, but that's the nature of the game. People in business, their drop bottom line is the next quarterly or annual report. They can't be thinking 20, 30, 40 years down the line. And so children and grandchildren are left out of our important equations. And the only way we can return them is when we as parents and grandparents start going to political meetings and start raising hell about coming generations. This, this new paradigm that you're describing to us, what does it mean in terms of what sort of really, truly meaningful lifestyle changes we should be making today? And also, what's your vision for what everyone's lifestyle should and will be like well, in the future? That's what the Transition Town Movement's all about, is to find out ways in which the communities can become much more sustainable into the future. At least that's what I understand it to be. And those are the kinds of questions. We, can we make it? I have no idea. But I'll tell you, a huge aid is coming to me in spreading my message. There's a man named Jeff Rubin in Canada who was the chief economist for one of our biggest banks in Canada for 20 years. And he got fired from, by the bank because he wrote a book called The End of Growth. And it's a big, been a big seller in the United States as well. Now here's one for you. So Jeff Rubin, The End of Growth. But here's another one. A man named Tim Morgan works for one of the biggest financial companies in the world in England, has written an 82-page paper, took me days to read the bloody thing, called uh, Perfect Storm. And it's about the end of growth. So both Rubin and Tim Morgan say the economy is just not going to recover from this turn down. It's just not, it's not the same. We've come to the end of growth. That's going to be a huge aid to those of us that say the economy can't keep growing. So how do we find a steady state economy? Japan's economy hasn't grown for 20 years. Each time I go to Japan, it looks fine to me. And after Fukushima, I say, holy cow, they got way too much energy waste here. They can go, they reduced their energy use by 25% almost overnight. And they can still, I believe, reduce it another 25% easily. So maybe Japan's got something to teach us. We don't need growth in order to get the necessities. But the most important group, I believe, that we have to listen to are people who grew up during the Depression. My mom and dad survived the Depression as young adults. And they taught me, it's in my DNA, that you live within your means. You save some for tomorrow. You share. You don't be greedy. You help your neighbor. You never know when you might need his help. Those are the things that were drummed into my head. And we've lost that now. It seems ludicrous the idea of living within your means. And that's what's plunged your country and mine into unbelievable debt. And we need those elders to tell us, how did you survive the Depression? This wonderful, wonderful uh, movie, uh, series on PBS now about the, uh, the Dirty Thirties, remember? What's his name, the great filmmaker? That... Yeah, just a wonderful series about the, and uh, you know, that, it's coming. And we better be prepared for that. Bhutan, I've come back from two visits to Bhutan this year. I'm on a working group trying to define what is happiness and how do you measure it. But uh, it's, I think very few people would opt for the way of life the Bhutanese have. It's a very hard way of life. But we've got to start degrowing de at a very rapid rate. And that means focusing on the things that really matter to us. What is it that matters? Let me end with a story, and that is the most important elder in my life was my father. 
And when he was 85, he was dying. Thank goodness it wasn't a painful form of cancer. I moved in to care for him the last two months of his life, and it was a wonderful time. We laughed and we cried and we talked and talked and talked. And in all that time, he kept saying, David, I die a wealthy man. He didn't have a cent in his pocket. I was subsidizing him uh, ever since my mom died. But uh, he kept saying, I die a wealthy man. The whole time we were together, he never talked about that big car he had in 1988 or the house he owned in London, Ontario or a closet full of fine f clothes. All he talked about were family, neighbors and friends and the things that we did together. That was my father's wealth. That's what mattered most to him at the end of his life. And in those things, he was truly wealthy. We'd better start thinking about it, what richness and prosperity really is. Thank you very much.